We'll move in our order around just a little bit to uh, uh, make things not uh, quite so predictable for you today. And we're uh, going to have the message at this time and instead of later on. And um, so we're going through 1 Corinthians here. You know, uh, I try to bring something in every week that uh, has to do with um, the context of, of what these words are. And, you know, it's, it's just really important to try to understand uh, who these people were and, you know, what it meant to them the first time so we don't misappropriate it. And this is an epistle, which means it's a letter. That's what that word means. And uh, Paul wrote a lot of letters to these churches that he started. And really, the epistle tells us what it means to follow Christ. That, that's what they all are telling us, is, is not just what he did, but, but how we follow. And that's why they're um, really important. And it's, of course, it's difficult to, to really know who these people were. We don't have a whole lot of information except what's in the, the, the letters themselves. And what I, you know, I, what I always look at is that there's these two extremes on people's opinions of ancients. And one is like the Hollywood extreme. And it's the way that Hollywood depicts people of the first century. And the way that Hollywood usually does this is that, you know, the, the men are all buff and they've got, you know, uh, just a little bit of facial hair, not too much. And they're usually Europeans. They, they've got bright teeth. You know, they've got teeth and they've got bright teeth. And that's what Hollywood, you know, so we'll kind of identify with them because we all look that way too, you know. And, and the women are all beautiful and they're trim. Oh, and, and, and Victoria uh, found her secret back there in the first century because the women all have foundation, you know. Would you stop and think about that? Would first century women really look? No, they would not. But that's the way that Hollywood wants to put this together. The other extreme is that we, we look back kind of with this snobbery on, because uh, we're so intellectual and we're so developed, and we look back on first century people, like the guys just kind of drag their knuckles on the ground when they walk, you know, and, and they kind of speak to each other with grunts, and, and they can barely have a society formed. And we have those, those two extremes. And somewhere in between there, you know, is where the Corinthians are. Uh, but I, the, the more I look at this, you realize the more things change, as the saying goes, the more things stay the same with human beings because we haven't changed a lot from these people. People are people, and God is God. And, and God relates to them in the same way. Today, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians 5, and we're going to do this whole chapter, 13 verses. Uh, I think it's on page 870 in your pew Bibles, if you need a little help there. Um, pew Bibles, boy, that's an old habit. Uh, floor Bibles. Uh, <laughs> chair Bibles, whatever they are here, those Bibles that we place around the room. So let's get into this. 1 Corinthians 5, beginning with the first verse, he says, Everyone has heard that there is sexual immorality among you. This is a type of immorality that it isn't even heard of among the Gentiles. A man is having sex with his father's wife. And you're proud of yourselves instead of being so upset that the one who did this thing is expelled from your community. Though I'm absent physically, I'm present in the spirit, and I've already judged the man who did this as if I were present. When you meet together in the name of our Lord Jesus, I'll be present in spirit and, and excuse me, I'll be present in spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus. At that time, we need to hand this man over to Satan to destroy his human weakness so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Your bragging isn't good. Don't you know that a tiny grain of yeast makes a whole batch of dough rise? Clean out the old yeast so you can be a new batch of dough, given that you're supposed to be the unleavened bread. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So let's celebrate the feast with the unleavened bread of honesty and truth, not with old yeast or with the yeast of evil and wickedness. I wrote to you in my earlier letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, but I wasn't talking about the sexually immoral people in the outside world by any means, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or people who worship false gods. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world entirely. 
But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who calls themselves brother or sister, who is sexually immoral, greedy, someone who worships false gods, an abusive person, a drunk, or a swindler. Don't even eat with anyone like this. What do I care about judging outsiders? Isn't it your job to judge, to judge insiders? God will judge outsiders. Expel the evil one from among you. This gets your attention, doesn't it? I mean, wow. Paul, Paul says to turn someone over to Satan. <laughs> and, and that, you know, that sounds a little bit unloving, doesn't it? I mean, just, just a little bit less than super tolerant to turn someone over to Satan. And, I mean, we may not immediately know what that means for them uh, and what it looks like in the Corinthians church. This translation uh, does a good job of, of really interpreting, I think, what that means. Paul says the man um, is bragging about sleeping with his stepmother, and, and Paul says here in verse 5, he says, hand this man over to Satan to destroy his human weakness so that his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord. And, you know, the man is um, bragging about this. He's not repentant. Uh, he thinks he's super, uh, you know, intellectual and, and really liberated. And he, he thinks, you know, I, I'm a Christian, but I can do these things anyway and, and how mature I am. And so Paul says, um, I'm not there in person, but when you meet, the Lord Jesus is in your midst and I'm there with you. And so put him out. Uh, you're not trying to move this man uh, into truth or repentance. Instead, you're right along with him going, man, aren't we a liberated church? Look, we can do anything that we want, and God still loves us, and, and there's, there, there's no consequences about this. And so he says, the only thing that I know to do then is to turn him over to the world, turn him over to this realm of the world that's ruled by Satan, and let Satan work on him. In other words, let him work on his, his flesh, his weaknesses, until he hurts enough that he realizes that he needs the body, that he needs God, and comes back. This man sleeping with his stepmother. And, you know, Corinth is a really, really kind of decadent place but even this way beyond what they would tolerate you know as Paul says not even the Gentiles do this and not even the pagans do this and here you are doing this and and you know in Corinth at the time man it, it was really anything goes marriage was just something that they had to raise children but if you were a man and you had enough money well you would have one or two what they called concubines uh, that was a servant who served your needs, if you get my implication there. And a man would have her living in the house with his wife, uh, one or two of them, if he was wealthy enough. And it wasn't considered to be immoral. They, they were completely amoral about their sexual uh, habits here. And, you know, yeah, man will be man, as they would say. They've got desires, and, you know, uh, you just have to put up with it. and. And it's, they kind of invented casual sex or, you know, hooking up as we call it today. Uh, just, just really normal back there in Corinthian, in Corinth. And yet Paul says, man, you've gone over the line even for them. Paul says they're not even to associate with this immoral person. In verse 9, he, he makes uh, a reference there to the first letter that he wrote to him. Really what we have here is the second letter, and we don't have the first letter um, but, he, but he tells them that anyone in the church community who is engaging in Im immorality, that they're not even to associate uh, them and with them. And, and the word immoral uh, in the Greek is one that we still use today, pornos, from which we get pornography. And what the word means, uh, it's, it's a huge word, it has this, you know, means a lot of things, it means any sexual activity, now this may shock you, any sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant is what this word means. And so uh, the old King James called it fornication. And uh, today the other translations will call it just simply 
sexual immorality. But, you know, this really isn't about sex. I know that's what we hear, but it's, it's not really about sex. Um, it's about the church. And, and I know that this really sounds intolerant. And, and in our present situation, it's like, this is the thing that the church gets blamed for. It's just, you know, putting labels on people and cutting people out and kicking people out. And that's, that's what the world looks at us as and says, oh, you, you guys, you're all just judgmental, you know. But, but this really is a word, and I think we can learn something here uh, about, about the church. Um, you know, the man can't come to their teaching, can't come to their fellowship, can't come to their communion. And he is what we would call shunned today. And literally, they, they just cut him off. And the purpose, though, is to save the man. That, that's Paul's heart all along. He wants to save two things. He wants to save the man. He wants to save the gospel. The gospel is just really important to him. And Paul uses some words here. And I, I think it tells us uh, a lot about um, the nature of of the church, the real nature. It's in verse 4. Paul says that when you meet together in the name of our Lord Jesus, I'll be present in spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus. He, he says that, that when you're together, like we are today, he says the Lord Jesus is with you. You know, we, we really formed this church around Matthew 18, 20, where Jesus says, where two or more gathered together in one place, I'll be there with you. Do, do we believe that or not? I mean, he says, if we're gathered together in his name, that he's here in our midst, and Paul is reiterating this and saying, when you're together in the Lord Jesus, he says, he's there, I'm there, the Holy Spirit's there, there's no distance, you see, in, in the Spirit whatsoever. And he says, when, when we're there in the name of the risen Lord, then, you know, in the body, you're to put him out. And, and Paul sees the, the church is just so powerful. So just infused with the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, I, I know that that's kind of hard for us in, in a small church where you, we're very comfortable here around each other. You know, little boys say things to his dad on stage that he should only probably stay at home. And, and you know, it's just kind of normal for us. And, and we're, we're very, as we would say, cozy with each other. And do, do we come to worship with the, with the idea that I'm going to a holy gathering where the Lord Jesus, the risen Christ, is going to be there this morning? No matter who else shows up, if there's two or three of us here and we're gathered together in his name, he's here doesn't make any difference how big the crowd is. The Lord shows up. And, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's difficult for us to regularly have that attitude when we come in, come in to worship. There's a lot of other things that we look for, but, but do, do we come here expecting to see Jesus, to be this kind of holy gathering? And Paul sees the church as just so powerful, just, just so infused with the Holy Spirit with, with, and with the, the authority of the risen Lord. And I just, you know, it just sounds strange today. I, I'm sorry. This, it's, in America, I, I think this kind of talk just sounds really weird to us. It, it may be foreign to all of our church experiences. And, you know, they saw the church as uh, Jesus and Paul did as, as this powerful, you know, uh, body that empowered believers, uh, full of the Holy Spirit, were together. And when they were together, it was like Jesus was there. It was like Jesus was on earth. He said, you'll do the same things that I do. No, nothing less than this. You know, and we look, you know, I think if our vision is of the church of being like a country club, it was like, well, you know, I paid my dues. I'm in. I'm in. I'm, I'm one of the members. You know, I wonder what the cook is cooking today. Uh, you know, uh, we're part of the club. Or if it's a shopping mall, you know, if our vision is kind of like, you know, I, I'm going to go there, get something. I'm going to consume something. Or, or, you know, maybe it's kind of Inspiration University where, where we, we, we get our minds enlarged, you know. Um, but we have all these different kinds of visions. Volunteer center, you know, that's where I go to, to do my thing. So much less than what, what Paul sees. So much less than what he sees about the church. And the Corinthians are saying, hey man, we can do anything we want to do. Because we got Jesus and we've been saved by grace. 
And He's given us liberty. And as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, I mean, God is love. We hear that today. I mean, we hear it a lot. And, and there's this just total, you know, lack of vision of what the church is supposed to be. And Paul says, not so fast, guys. You really don't understand. You have this kind of twisted, you know, gospel. Uh, this is the, isn't the gospel that I gave you. God, it's true that God is love. It's true that, that grace, you know, that we get God's grace and this is what saves us. But this lie that, that you're living by, that Christ has given you freedom to do anything that you want to do, and, and that it's not hurting anybody, he's saying that's, that's just twisted things, you know? And, and if you don't do something about this, it's going to infect everybody. It's not only going to infect your little church, but it's going to affect everybody that you reach. Everybody that you talk to is going to get this infection that you've got, and they're going to go, man, let's get, be a Christian because you can, you can go to heaven and you can do anything you want to do. It's infectious. It spreads. He says, more, more than anything, you have to start being the, the temple of God. Remember we talked about that a couple weeks ago back there from the third chapter. You, uh, you Christians together in the body, you are a temple. You contain me. And when we're talking about this, I think it's helpful to compare this with, with Matthew 18. Uh, boy, there's Matthew 18, that, that whole section there, that, that's also in that same section where Jesus says, if two or more are gathered together, there I am in your midst. Right before that, he, he, he gives these clear directions on what we're supposed to do in the church. And he said, if somebody gets into sin and they're, they're not turning back, then one of you go and talk to them. And if that doesn't work, then take somebody else with you, two or three with you. And if they still say, no, no, I don't see anything wrong with that, I'm going to do it anyway, then you bring it up to the whole church. It's Jesus telling this. It's hard to do today. I mean, I mean, the whole procedure thing is like, you know, how do we go about this? But then Jesus says, it, even if, if you bring them up to the whole church and everybody goes, man, you're doing this wrong, you're, you're, you're twisting things, you're not supposed to be acting like this, and they still say, I'm going to do it anyway, I got freedom in Christ, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, you, you guys are stupid, you, then it says, then you're supposed to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector, which actually is kind of the same thing that Paul said, kind of turn them over, you know. Let them get worked on for a while. See what it's like to step out of that umbrella of grace and the body that you've been enjoying. So then Paul becomes a baker. And he uses the metaphor of yeast or leaven. Everybody, you ever use yeast, leaven? You know what that is? You know? Yeah. I, I was a bread baker um, 25 years ago. Yeah, I was. Uh, Leah may have forgotten that, but I was. I was a bread baker 25 years ago. I was going through seminary my last semester. I was a chaplain at, at Central Baptist, and I was really having a difficult time with the problem with hospitals that people die in hospitals. And that was one of my jobs, was to be with them as they were dying. And it, it was rough. I, I'm really not cut for that, you know. Um, I, I, do it, but it, it's just anybody that does it. it it's just, it's just I, I, my hat's off to chaplains. So what I was doing was I'd come home and I needed some therapy, so I decided to be a bread baker. I don't know how that started, but, but in the typical Don fashion, I thought if one loaf of bread is good, six or eight are much better. So let's become <laughs> the biggest, best bread maker ever, you know. And so uh, I'd come home from, from seminary and, you know, I'd mix the stuff together and you'd activate the yeast and put it in there and you'd knead it and then you'd leave it and it'd grow. I actually was, was doing southern sourdough, you know, that's how advanced I got was doing southern sourdough where you have just a little bit left over from the previous batch and you don't actually use yeast, you use this little seed. But you know, what you do is you, you knead it and then you put it in a bowl and after many failures I figured out how to do this. I had the right bowl, had the right cloth to go over the top, put it up on top of the refrigerator because the refrigerator is just the right temperature to make it warm, you know, and, and puff up and then you'd come back like in an hour, hour and a half and you'd punch it down, knead it a little bit more, let it grow back up again. If you wanted it really fluffy, you know, you'd knead it two times and let it, let it puff up. 
And, you know, I baked a lot of bread, and the family would be in bed sometimes, and I still had bread all over the kitchen. And, and you know, I got to get this baked, you know, it'd be like 2 o'clock in the morning, you're in there baking bread, and they're, you know, like they think that they've fallen asleep at Panera's or someplace. And, and that's what the house is like. But there was this one instance, I remember our, our house was next to the church, and, and I, I was making my bread, and I put it up there on top of the refrigerator, and there it was up there in the bowl, and I ran over to the church to do something, and one thing ran into another, and about, you know, three hours later, I come back, and there's the bread, and it's like, you know, coming down over the refrigerator, you know, it's going to take over the whole house, it's, it's looking for small children to eat, you know, and to pull into itself. And it's, and it's like, you know, just a little bit of yeast is all that it takes to get really puffed up if you leave it there long enough. And uh, that's, that's what Paul was talking about, a little bit of yeast. He, he uses this metaphor. It's a reference, actually, to Passover, to the Passover meal. And he says, Christ is our Passover lamb. He has been sacrificed for our sins. And at Passover, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Jewish culture, what they did was yeast represented hidden sin. Sin that they had that they had not dealt with, that had that kind of come into their lives, maybe even unseen. And at Passover, they had this ritual where they would, you know, they would be repentant and try to clean out the yeast inwardly, but the outward act would be that the father of the house would take little pieces of, of yeast bread and hide them, ten pieces, in the house. And then they would, right before Passover uh, feast happened, they would go by candlelight and the children would go throughout the house and try to find all ten pieces. And this was a teaching thing for them to show them the yeast is like your sin. You have to watch your soul, okay? And so Paul's making reference to this, and, and because he's making reference in this way, I kind of think what he's talking of is a Jewish Christian, not a Gentile Christian. And I think this Jewish Christian in, has, has, you know, been freed from the law of Moses that he was under for so long. And now he's found the liberty of Christ, and he's going, man, anything goes. This is great being a, being a Jesus follower, because I don't have to do all that other stuff. I can do anything that I want to do. And I, I really think that's what Paul's, who's Paul's talking to. And Paul says that sin is infectious. It's dangerous in the sense that once we begin to overlook one thing, that it spreads to something else. And we didn't intend for it to get this big. But, but suddenly it's, it's bigger than what we ever intended. And, and now it's so big it's become this huge problem. There's dough coming down over our refrigerator all over the place. And we got this mess to clean up. And it just started with just a little bit. The one man's sin, especially since he's bragging about it, is infecting other people. See, like it or not, there are some boundaries. This, this is where we always get misunderstood. We start talking about boundaries, because everybody wants to know where the boundaries are so I can go right up to it. And maybe I can kind of stick my foot over and taste it just a little bit, then jump back, you know, is what we talk about. Do you notice his boundaries here? He says, now, he says, for the church, he said, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't intend that you would ever stop associating with people who are in the world. You, you stop associating with, with Christ followers who, who are going crazy and, and they don't care. And, you know, you don't hang around those people. But he says, but people in the world, yeah, I expect you. You don't judge them. You're supposed to be around them. And isn't it funny how the church, that we are so good at telling the world how to live, I mean, we're great at telling the government what to do. You know, they're, they're supposed to have our morals. And, and everybody, that, even that's out of covenant, they're not in covenant with God at all, but, but, but yeah, we want to post the Ten Commandments for them, and we're supposed to make all these moral laws for the country to live by. And, and Paul's going, you know, huh, well, what are you doing? The laws are, you know, these restrictions are for you. It's not for them. You're, yeah. well, when our kids, this is kind of embarrassing, uh, but I'll tell it anyway because you'll think it's funny. When, when, when we were young Christians and our kids were little, they just told me this, this, this story uh, not too long ago that we were on vacation down at Disney World and the boys ran into this other family and there's some little kids to play with in the hotel and the boys asked them if they were Christians and they said no and they said, well, then we can't play with you. Somehow they had that in their heads from us that non-Christians were the enemies. See? 
And sometimes we act like that. You know, these people off there, they're, I go to church. Now, our lives are the same, but I go to church so I'm a little bit better than you. Isn't that funny how the church does that? It's like, you know, our boundary becomes this safety thing for us, for us to do whatever we want on the inside. But there's also some boundaries within the church. I mean, we've messed that up. Um, Paul lists a few areas, things which are indications that there have been some serious deviation from the path. And, you know, he says, sexually immoral, greedy, swindlers, people who worship false gods, abusive person, or a drunk. Those are what he lists. He's got some other lists, too. Um, think of Galatians 5, 19. Starts with a list of sins. Uh, next week, we'll have another list. It's very similar to this out of the sixth chapter. But the list, you know, they're necessary to say, these are the kinds of people. When a person is doing these things, it means he's not even trying to follow Christ. He, he's just saying, I, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Or he's so taken over by this that they really need some help. And, you know, when the church says, man, it doesn't make any difference what you do, and anybody can, you know, it doesn't make any difference. If you love Jesus, that's cool. You know, you're in the church. That gets to be really dangerous when we say nothing matters. When I go backpacking, a lot of times I go off trail. They call that bushwhacking. Um, it's like my one attempt to bravely go where no man has gone before, you know, that, that type of thing. And, um, uh, it's really kind of silly. I, I, I don't do it too much anymore because, you know, you think, oh, this path's getting boring. I wonder what's over that ridge. There's no path or down in that valley, so you take off. And it's fine for a while, and then you've got stickers and brush, and you're trying to slide down hills or crawl up cliffs. and trying to get. Usually you end up going backwards back to, to the path is what you end up doing. But I, I love doing that, just kind of a little bit of adventure out when you're backpacking. And a couple years ago, I went through this thing where like I was going, okay, I've got a new backpack, I'm going ultralight, I can go backpacking again, I'm fat, but I can still get out there and do this. And so instead of carrying 50 pounds, you know, now I'm gonna carry 25 pounds. So I was looking for all these adventures to go on. And I, I was looking at Big South Fork down in Tennessee, which we'd been down there quite a bit. And there was a trail and you got on the trailhead and it followed the, the Cumberland River. And the Cumberland River goes like this a lot, you know. And so the trail was going like that. And I was looking at the trailhead and I thought, you know, that's five miles around to that point that if I went straight over that hill, I could get there in about two miles. And so, you know, I thought, that's what I'm going to do. And I was ready and had all my maps and my GPS coordinates and all that kind of stuff. And I got to thinking, you know, there might not be cell phone down there. and There, there might not even be GPS down there. I, I, I don't know. You know, there's places in Tennessee, I'm sure, that satellites can't get into. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there are. And so just at a point of weakness and probably because Nina was, you know, like in 20 hours of prayer a day as I was telling her that I was going to go down there by myself and bushwhack, I called up the ranger. And, and there was a ranger down there, and she was a really nice lady. And um, I said, this is what I'm thinking of doing. I'm thinking of bushwhacking from point A to, you know, to five here on the map. And she says, you know, something like, well, uh, I would strongly, strongly uh, urge you not to do that. Um, that is very, very dense very dense brush and there are snakes lots of snakes poisonous snakes okay and so like for three or four nights I had dreams of me sleeping out in the open on my tarp with snakes you know they were dragging me into their snake den in my, <laughs> is, is what I had envisioned and needless to say I, I didn't go down there bushwhacking but I was grateful for a, a guide for someone to tell me that you can't see everything on your map that you're going to experience as you walk out there and start going out on your own. And it, it, it strikes me that the church doesn't need so much of a map, uh, you know, with all of the dangers listed, um, you know, which we can't do to stay in fellowship with God. But, but the church, it's more important, I think, that we have a compass, a compass you can use 
If you know how to read a compass, you can be anywhere. If you know how to use one, uh, it, it doesn't make any difference, you know, where you are or where you've landed. If you know your destination point, you can find out how to get there. And, you know, a compass, you know, north is north from anywhere. And I think sometimes as we fought, try to follow Jesus Christ, we, we find ourselves bushwhacking, kind of go through some areas where we're not sure what's what. We're, we're not sure what all the rules are. We're not sure exactly where we want to go or, or, or what this means, you know, by what's happening around us. And we get off trail a lot of times, and, and we need someone that's, that's gone that way before. And, you know, really a guide is, is what we need. We need some lady. We need a ranger, you know, some kind of a guide to say, I've used this, this compass for years, and I know how to get there, and, and I know what's in that turf. And if you would allow me to walk with you, if, if we could do this together, if, if you don't want to bushwhack by yourself, if you would come with me and we could do this together, I, I, I think we could get you where you want to go. I think God is still telling us there's a, a direction to him. You know, in, in the midst of everything that's going on in our culture and in our lives, God, God definitely has a direction. And there's some boundaries, you know. And there are places where, you know, there's heavy brush and there's a lot of snakes, poisonous snakes. Don't go there. And so he says, stay in the body. Just, just, just stay in that fellowship with other people. You know, so stay, stay around some other people. You, you do have a compass there, and, and they're going to help you read it. They're, they're going to help discern what, what really is true and what's, what's not. Later on, Paul would write to another church, the churches of Galatia, and they had a different problem. It wasn't that they had liberty. They were going back to the old Jewish law, all right? And it's a whole other um, story there, but they were saying, you got to keep all these law things in order to get to God, and, and, and Paul really came down on them. But in it, there's a verse there that I think is just a, a real seminal, uh, important verse for it. It's Galatians 5.16. He says, I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry out your selfish desires. Be guided by the Spirit. Do you know what that means? I mean, do you, do you know what it means to be guided by the Spirit? That sounds like such a, you know, it, it's in Scripture all the time. And, and, and yet, to Paul and, and to other Christians, this is real. This isn't just church talk. This just isn't Bible stuff. You can be guided by the Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit to a degree where the Spirit, you, you begin to recognize the voice of Jesus. You begin to recognize what God's telling you. The, you know, the ranger will start speaking to you and, and telling you exactly where the dangers are and telling you where you need to go. And, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is so real, so tangible, so powerful that we can follow him. What a promise that is. You know, sometimes we hear stuff like this and we go, man, you know, I, I'm just messing this up. This is so huge and, and I'm not even close to this. Grab onto the promise. God wants to lead us. God wants to speak to us. He, 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 wa he wants to talk to us. And, and sometimes that happens in the body. Uh, usually it, it happens first individually. I, I want to ask you today, are, are, you, are you hearing something from God? Or is, has God been speaking to you in your life? A question we always ask, you know, if, if you're hearing something from God, what are you doing about it? Are you doing anything about it? Are we just here and walk away? You know, just, oh, God told me this. And then I, I, I didn't, didn't try to do anything about it. Jesus says that's really foolish when you do that. Will you receive that today? Are you hearing God? Strong word. I mean, I, I admit, I, I shared this um, with, with a couple of pastors, and they said, that's, that's really strong, Don really strong. And I said, yeah, I know. I, I hope they receive it the way that it's intended by Paul and intended by me to, to give it, you know. I, I, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be a weak ranger. When there's snakes, I want to tell us about the snakes. Wouldn't you tell me about the snakes? 
Yeah, there's poisonous snakes out there. I, I, I want us to know about the poisonous snakes. And Paul says, this stuff is real. This is infectious. If you don't stop it, if you don't turn from it, okay, it's not going to be good. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be much worse probably than what we even envision. Because it, it's just like the yeast. It's just a little bit at a time. We just become more puffed up and more puffed up with it until finally we can't even see where it came from and it's got us. Well, let's, let's take a moment and uh, I'll, I want you to have the opportunity to uh, do something with this this morning. Uh, maybe God's saying something to you and you say, I, I know what I need to do. I, don't, don't just say, I'll think about it later. Write it down right now. Take one of those pencils and write it down on your bulletin or write it on something, you know. Say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a commitment today. I'm going to say, this is what I intend to do about this. Okay. As deep cries out.